Hello, hello. Hello. <laughs> so finally, here we are. Welcome all of you, ITM members and international guests and Bulgarian participants to ITM Sofia Plenary Meeting 2024, Burn-In, Burn-Out. Yes, indeed. And we are so happy to be here. Vesco and Topper Centrella team, thank you for going again 10 years later. And now, in your fantastic new venue, which ITM had something to do about. And yes. I will let you tell the story, Vesco. Yes, indeed. Some of you remember or experienced how this place looked like 10 years ago. Two ruins full of holes, dirt, broken glass, and surrounded by jungle. It all started with a civil initiative of an ind independent artistic scene under the name Association Toplo Centrala, which was supported by two amazing European networks, ITM and Trans Europal, on the meeting in 2014 and was recognized by the municipality and the city council of Sofia and the Ministry of Culture of Bulgaria and the foreign cultural institutes. And the journey started. Seven years of intensive public dialogue, working groups, meetings, imagining, exploring, planning, international architectural competition and construction works right during the heavy COVID times to open Toplo Centrala activities in late 2021. Since then, for two years and a half, 2,300 events. All arts involved. Thank you, Toplo Centrala team. Wouldn't be possible without them. All arts involved, diverse communities, over 3,000 artists, from Bulgaria and abroad. Almost 50 companies were guests already here. 140 residents and almost 200,000 people audience. A great example what we can do when we are united, persistent, intelligent, strong, together and networking. Wow, what a story, Vasco. I, su I suggest we give them a round of applause. This is the beauty of networks, of international networks, of local networks, and of daring professionals. And we, all of us ITM members, really want to congratulate the Topper Centella team, the Bulgarian performing arts scene, the city of Sofia, the artistic community of Bulgaria, the Ministry of Culture, and may the Topper Centella spirit bring further developments and recognition of the important contribution of the Bulgarian independent sector. <laughs> now, for the next four days, in the company of 450 colleagues from 55 countries, you will have the opportunity to attend and contribute to versatile sessions. Some are IATM old and gold, with lots of network opportunities and new meeting points. Some are new experiments, and several are dealing with the topics IATM has been focusing on, fairness, working condition, inclusion, and last but not least, the ever, whoa, where is my notes here? I don't see this. <laughs> the arts role faced with a very heated globe. More on that in a minute. This meeting curated program aims to encourage and support locally rooted yet international conversations, where we strive to understand and find the balance between local realities and global dynamics, and that we agree that no one, no person, no country, no region of this still beautiful earth that we inhabit is the holder of the truth. Yet, together, we can make a lasting contribution for our sector 
and for our common space. Burning, burnout. With this meeting, we also wanted to tackle the increasing phenomenon of burnout in our sector. We asked ourselves, what is the opposite of burnout? And how can we have more of it? In the next days, you will have a lot of burning opportunities. A quiet, cozy, relaxed room to, lo to rest from words, to visit from time to time when you need. Quiet river that never stops flowing. Park, lawns, hammocks, healthy food, water for free to hydrate in the heat. Morning sessions to connect with the body. Special practical workshop led by a specialist with anti-burnout anti techniques. Sensory experience to go within, uh, called portal, 100 meters upstream, the river. Numerous possibilities to go in for 15 minutes in our planetarium to connect with the stars and the infinity in us. While discussing many topics, let's not forget in the next four days our inner e ecology. And remember that for the solving of any problem, on first place, we need to be there, present, centered, and connected with our inner selves. We have had the privilege of working with dedicated collaborating partners as well as good fortune of generous support from a wide range of funding bodies which have allowed us to embark on the journey. And we want to thank them. First up, the Creative Europe Program of the European Union. The Ministry of Culture of Bulgaria. The Municipality of Sofia and the Municipality of Varna. CVS, an uh, organization that helped us with volunteers, Foreign Cultural Institutes, a unique. And the venues and the partners? Yeah, 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 yeah. I will start with the Rida Dance Center, very close friends. Yalta Art Room, IM Studio, National Theater. These are the venues you can see artistic production, not a part of Toplot Centrala. Also, we would like to thank TAM, Veliko Ternovo, the initiative of Christo and Jean-Claude Center, Gabrovo, Varna Dance Festival, Ribonkers, and Eunik again. And now Vasco will make the introductions to the dignitaries in the room, the Mayor of Sofia and the Minister of Culture, and I'm going to step from the stage. Yes, now I would like to invite uh, the Mayor of Sofia, Mr. Vasil Terziv. Warm welcome. Uh, dear Mrs. Uh, Richard Dutier, Minister, Mr. Dimov, friends from the independent sector. Ten years ago, the largest performing arts network, IETM, held its annual meeting at the National Palace of Culture in Sofia. As I heard last week, a question was raised then about the lack of space for free artists to perform. The answer was the idea of creating a center for contemporary arts in our city. I'm glad that today, ten years later, ITM is back in Sofia and holding its annual meeting in this Center for Contemporary Art, Toput Centrala. It's a good opportunity to thank uh, the former mayor, Fandakova, the Minister, Ministry of Culture, the Municipal Council, and especially the independent sector, which helped uh, for this to, to become a reality. It was one of the first and best bottom-up projects that, that we've seen, and hopefully there will be many more to come. So, warm welcome to your home, a space created. A space created by your initiative and with the active participation of contemporary artists and the non-governmental sector in um, culture. Art is what makes us put aside our daily tasks and look higher and aim beyond everyday issues and challenges. It has the power to recharge us, to change us, because it touches minds and hearts. It is the best ambassador of any idea, a book, a film, 
They can make millions of people around the world feel something, make them look deeper and change. Art can turn people into a community, regardless of the distance that separates them. Modern art, together with Sofia's ancient culture, creates our city's soul. The topic today, burn in, burn out, is relevant for all professions and especially relevant for freelance artists. Everybody needs a friendly uh, system, a sustainable working and living space. However, freelance artists are the most vulnerable. The creative process requires enormous energy and that puts every artist to the test. So finding solutions for recovery and time to recharge is extremely important. Having a community to support you, equally so. I believe that this community will find the formula for the status of the free artist in the modern world and propose local and European policies to support those artists. I'm happy that during the annual meeting, Bulgarian artists will be able to exchange ideas with their international uh, guests, find partners and show their projects to an exclusive audience, their colleagues from all over the world. I wish you all success uh, and a wonderful few days. I believe that you will find time to explore our wonderful city, which has a lot to offer in terms of history, in terms of culture, green parks, hospitality, and above all, nice people that are going to give you a lot of good energy. So enjoy, and thank you all for being here. Now I will invite on stage for a welcoming words the Minister of Culture of Bulgaria, Mr. Maestro Naiden Todorov. <laughs> burnout. What is it? No idea. What I know is that I hope that during the next few days we will have burning ideas here that you create. About the burnout, you, you can just look at me. <laughs> well, Since I'm burned out, I have to say a few things that are not so funny. This is about the artist, you know. We want to talk about the statute of, of the artist, but actually, first of all, we have to define what an artist is. And I would like to remind those of you who do not know it, a very funny, famous story, a meeting between Charles Chaplin and Albert Einstein, where... Einstein says to Chaplin, I admire you, you're amazing. Without even saying a word, the world understands you and they admire you. Chaplin says to Einstein, I admire you even more. You say so much, no one understands you and they still admire you. <laughs> so, you know, I think both of them are a bit of definition for an artist. You know, Einstein was not only a scientist, he was a very good violin player. And if we ask any in the world, but also our Minister of Finances, what an artist is, they'll say, well, ah, those people there that spend money, you know, this is all they see. So, what is an artist? I don't know. Artists are people that I would define in two categories. The first one, those who create. And the second one, those who perform. Those who translate what is created to the audience. Uh, the other word of translation is interpretation. So, interpreter, those are the artists. But what is the difference between science and art? When you translate the art, 
you put there something of yourself, something of your soul. So it is not exact translation, you are co-creator. So let's say artists are the creators in the world. And you know where is the first place you can see and read the word creator? The Bible. You know about what artist I'm talking. Yeah. So, you creators, I'm so happy to be here with all of you. And I'm so happy to hope that during the next few days we will get your burning ideas about the statute of the artist, about how we are going to work in the future with the artists. Bulgaria had difficulties with that. I, I think not only Bulgaria, but I am sure about Bulgaria. And there was something that helped us, believe it or not, the pandemic. The pandemic helped the state of Bulgaria to see the independent artists. Because no one saw them before that. Because of the pandemic, the state started working to help the independent artists. So if you have independent artists, who should be the other? The de depend dependent artists? <laughs> Those on the salaries. You think they have no problems? They do. They get salaries, and in a certain moment, they feel safe, and they become employees, or so they think. In a certain moment, they're they just stop being artists. Because when you feel safe, when you feel that everything is fine, do you want to go in any direction? No, you, go, you just want to stay there. You want just to be safe and do nothing. Doing nothing is just the opposite of creation. So we have to help both type of artists, the independent artists and those who became employees. We have to help really both of them, and we are trying, like this year, the Bulgarian parliament made uh, some changes in the law and allowed us to create a professional register of the artists, of all professional artists. This is the very beginning. But being part of the state right now, I have to say, there is also a danger. The state has to be very careful how it helps. Because putting too much force is not always good. And especially it, if it comes from outside and the state is outside the art. You know, there is a famous sentence in Bulgaria, maybe not only in Bulgaria, about the egg and the force. If you use force to the egg, from outside to inside, you destroy it, you destroy the life inside. But if the direction of this force is from inside out direction, then life is created. And this is the role of the state, not to force the artists do something, but just to help them, to make the possible conditions for them to exist and to go to the future. Because, you know, no society can exist in the future without the art, especially today when we have artificial intelligence. I mean, it can do anything, just not art. The art is still reserved for us, and it will always be. We can use the artificial intelligence. We have to. This is the future. But being human, meaning being creator, means also being an artist. And I'm very happy to know so many artists, not only here, but also all over the world. And I hope that together we will fight, find the right definition 
for the future of the artists, because the problem is not just the status. The problem is not just to say who is an artist, who is not. The problem is not just to say what is a burning idea or who burned out. You know, the problem is to understand that without the artists, our society has no future. So thank you and have luck. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Minister. I feel sure your words will resonate with us in the next four days, and we will discuss them and digest them. But many thanks for being with us today. We are very, very grateful. Now, I have the great pleasure to welcome our keynote speaker of the day to the stage, but first, a little bit about him. Pascal Gielen is a writer and professor of Sociology of Culture and Politics at the Antwerp Research Institute for the Arts, where he leads the Culture Commons Quest Office. He is an editor of the international book series Anton, Arts in Society, the author of numerous books which have been translated into several languages. His keynote is the kick-off inspiration of this meeting, entitled Sensing Earth, Culture Quests Across a Heated Globe. Pascal, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you for, ah, it works. Thank you for inviting me. It's, it's an honor uh, to be here. Um, thank you, ITM. Uh, thank you, uh, Toplo Centrala, to host uh, me. Um, I'm not such a good speaker, so I'm curious why you invited me. But anyway, we will see how it works. <laughs> but you mentioned already the reason why, I, why I'm standing here is because I, I make books. And uh, this was one of the books. And I think it is also, I guess, it inspired also the, the topic of, of, this whole, uh, of this whole meeting. And I will say a little bit about it. Normally, I don't show books that I write because it sounds like a kind of stupid promotion or something like that. But this has a history, and that's why I, I, I want to show it. And by just looking at the cover, I remember this history. It was, in, I think, in the first year of COVID that we start thinking about the book, uh, together with uh, Philip Dietagmar of uh, European Culture Foundation, who is sitting there and who will lead to tomorrow also a workshop. And in the discussion, I think, I don't remember it all anymore, but anyway, I remember one thing that uh, Philip said, we have a problem. As European Culture Foundation, we are stimulating enormously traveling over the world. Uh, we participate in all those Creative Euro projects, etc. Uh, and there is enormous ecological footprint related to that, how to solve this problem. No idea. But that's the topic of the book, of course, and we said, okay, we have to think about it, invite people uh, to work on it. it the, normally, I make books in one year because you need to be precise and actual. This took longer because COVID was there. One of the editors who's not on the cover, that's why I show also the cover, felt out because of a burnout. So it really uh, informed the whole content of the book, what happened. We, by accident, because somebody fell out, we went to search for somebody else. And we said, yes, but we have to involve certainly also the Global South. So that's why uh, Georgia Nicolau uh, came in. And we asked her, she's from Brazil, uh, to discuss again the concept of the uh, book, which was already uh, there. And then we discovered, especially mobility, is understood completely different in the global south than in the global north. And especially the solutions also, ecological solutions, uh, we tried to find out. So we had not so heated discussions, but we had discussions about that and our idea about what we have to do with uh, uh, mobility. 
So, uh, having said that, uh, a lot of things happened during uh, making the book. Nicole, uh, Georgia got a child, also, positive thing uh, in it, but that also made that it took some time to make the book again. Uh, and then uh, the war in Ukraine started, also. So, we also try to adapt this even uh, in, uh, in the book. But that's the only reason why it, uh, it took so long. That's the main uh, idea of the book, which came out also thinking about burnout, is that that, that was the starting point that, or the, uh, I said, a thought which came up was, is there a relationship between an overheated earth and uh, our overheated brains? Is there a relationship between burnout and uh, um, climate change, uh, heating, etc.? And especially this idea came up with looking at my son. It's not really my son uh, uh, there, but I can. I talked with him about this. My my son is. Uh, addicted to gaming. He's sitting always in front of a flat screen. Uh, and uh, this does something with his brain. As a parent, I know. And this is also something which I discovered during COVID, having a lot of those online meetings, teaching online, etc you saw immediately it does something with social relationships, but it does also something literally with uh, uh, our brains. And I think this is, this is for me the main discussion, for me at least, the main also emotional discussion uh, we try to find out uh, in this book. So it is literally how uh, our our brains get overheated, but also our societies get overheated. While we are looking, and maybe it's one of the reasons why we get overheated, our brains, because we are always looking to those flat screens, and more and more. So it's very speculative, but I think there is a kind of uh, uh, link uh, between those two things. Now I jump to Ukraine. I um, went uh, last year in February to Ukraine to do research and interviewed a lot of artists. Qu main question was two things. One is what are doing artists in war? And the second question was what about pacifism nowadays? And one artist I met and talked a lot with him was Sasha Ball. He's a singer-songwriter. Sasha Boy, sorry, a singer-songwriter. But he has written also one novel. And the novel is called Ivy. And it's a very interesting book. I don't read Ukraine, so I have never read the book. But we talked for hours about it. And he said something very interesting about the end of the book. In the, in the, the book is written before the full scare, uh, scale invasion in Ukraine. And in a way, he uh, predicts what is going to happen uh, in this book. And the end of the book shows us an earthly paradise. It's very strange. It's all with uh, runes in it. Uh, uh, um, and there is one thing uh, very dominant in, in, the, in this, how he describes uh, this paradise. Um, all is covered by ivy. And there is something on. There are no people anymore in this paradise. And this is very interesting. And he said himself, uh, by the way, Sasha Bo was at that moment when I interviewed him a soldier. So he had to go to the front line again. And he said, I don't know if this end is no dystopic of utopia. And what was for me very interesting, because what he exactly meant by that was maybe we have to think, when we think about climate change and climate action, we have to think about another possible horizon, horizon, 
without people. Maybe we think then much more lucid about climate action, which is a very dark uh, picture of it. But at the same time, he said, I feel quite happy with that. I can go to war with this idea. Uh, that nature will survive, uh, but it will only survive when there are no people anymore. Very strange th uh, thinking uh, for me, but what was for me very, uh, yeah, uh, mind blowing, uh, I have to say. And so also this, this idea came for me a, a part of the book and thinking about uh, climate struggle. But of course it remembers me at one thing, climate struggle is very anthropocentric. We, the first thing what we in fact want to do is saving our own skin. We do it for the future for our children, no? So we do it for humans. And I think it's a very important thing not to forget because I think a lot of solutions we, we nowadays uh, uh, get from technicians, from scientists also, are technical solutions. So they are searching for solutions, for example, in changing nature. But in fact, I think the main, and this is a good thing, eh? this, so it is not a problem at all, I think. But I think the main change needs to come from human and needs to be orientated also again to human. And that is, I think, a very important thing. So that's for me also that the crisis in nature is in fact a cultural crisis. We need to focus, I think, very much on what culture is, how we give sense to our life, to nature, sense to uh, our society, to find uh, solutions uh, for that. So that's the main, or that's maybe the second main message in the book is that science and technology cannot save the world. There is something else what we need to do. Uh, and we see this nowadays, a lot of people Think about, for example, Elon Musk or whatever, who's thinking about uh, uh, if we can't do it here and not anymore, we, uh, we search for another planet or something like that. Or the only solution or a solution is not uh, uh, driving anymore with fossil uh, cars, but with electric cars. I don't think this is the whole solution. There needs to be more uh, than that. And again, I think uh, it is related to uh, uh, cultural change. So for me, main thing is to say, when we focus on climate change, climate action, it's very important to be aware that we are always looking to save ourselves in the first place. And from that position on, uh, it's interesting, I think, to look at uh, climate problems, ecological problems uh, in general. And this is, in fact, a very old thought. Uh, uh, it came already, I, uh, certainly from the, from the 60s of the 70s. And I'm sorry for that, but I put it here, the... Um, the symbol of the, uh, the, Bel uh, the Belgian, or I have to say the Flemish, the Dutch-speaking uh, Green Party. They started with another name. And I say it first in English, uh, uh, first in Dutch, and then I, I translate it in English. It's saying, it's standing, anders gaan leven. It means changing our way of living. Wor oh, sorry, I say it wrong. Anders gaan leven, arbeiden en vrijen. It means literally changing our way of living, working, and making love. That was the original 70s, of course. Uh, but uh, what is interesting, especially what they said about making love. So they said literally a little bit like Sasha Ball in Ukraine said, maybe procreation is not the best reason to make love. So making children is maybe not the solution, and maybe we have to think also, it's a very dangerous thought what I say now, maybe we have to think about how many children we want to put on the world, because one of the main problems, ecological problems, is overpopulation. 
be aware, but it is true. So they were really thinking about that. It's a very strange thought. I know it's a dangerous thought, but it is a very important one, again, I think, to think. And I think it was uh, Friedrich Nietzsche who once said, Earth is sick, and the sickness is called human. Also there, you see, again, this kind of uh, focus on, on, on the human. But anyway, what I want to say, of course, is again put it's very important to put human in central and be conscious uh, of that uh, and also to try to convince people by changing culture and presenting other alternatives because what we see and i think here art comes in and i come later to that and also aesthetics because we see that science does not convince that we get climate report after climate report we don't change life I'm sorry to say, I'm here by airplane. For several reasons, I cannot explain you later, but that's problematic, of course. We don't change our behavior so fast, uh, so we need to be convinced by other things. So science alone is not enough. Empirical proof does not convince us to change our behavior. We need to have other things. That's why I also say we need kind of what I call cultural revolution, I'm not referring to Mao, it's another cultural revolution. Uh, it's not, uh, has nothing to do with this bloody ideology uh, of him. But there was something very important, I think, and he was not busy with that, he was not busy with climate change. But one very important thing was collectivization. As a very important solution, and I think collectivization, again, it's strange to say this here, I know, in this context, but it's very important to look at collectivization as a possible solution for ecological problems. I'm not talking about the old communist collectivization, of course, but for example, just sharing cars. It's a kind of collectivization of uh, uh, goods, which could be uh, a solution. So in that sense, we really have to get out our individualistic bubble and think again about uh, collective uh, solutions. That's for me a huge part, I think, a cultural revolution needs to be uh, about. But then I come back to the second topic of the book, which I started with and why we also start to discuss the concept of the book. And this is what we called in the, in the book itself uh, the nearness conundrum. And that means that when you want to have cultural exchange and good cultural exchange, you need to go on the spot. I need to be on stage here to talk with you. It would be awful and I don't... I try to refuse it now to still give online talks. It doesn't work for me because you then don't get uh, uh, the good response. We all know this, certainly when you make theater or performances, etc. Life experience is so important. Yeah? You cannot replace this by uh, digital tools. And this came up with, with um, when I was talking with uh, philosopher Marlies de Munk, which I made this book during COVID, uh, when we are thinking about teaching online and what, what, does, what does this do with you, what does this do with the students, but also having meetings uh, 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 online. So this is a very important thing and that's for me the nearness conundrum. First of all, you need to be close to each other, to communicate, to have cultural, good cultural exchange. But at the other side, you need to be, for ecological reasons, you need to stay also, in a way, local, or more local, near to nature again. And this is, for me, kind of problem a lot of uh, artists have nowadays. For example, do we no go, need to go back to just local artists who don't travel international anymore? There's no tra international exchange anymore. Or do we, can we change this uh, in another way? This is a tension which is not solved in the book. I have to be honest about that. But it is for me a very important uh, uh, discussion um, uh, for me anyway. But the main reason and what is the topic of this book is exactly is, was the question is, one question was, can digital relationships, so online relationships, replace physical relationships? And 
if so, what does it do then with social uh, uh, relationships? So is digitalization, online culture, maybe a solution for culture? Yeah, that we don't have to travel anymore and that we can give the performances maybe online uh, in a way. So, again, thinking about that and coming back to, um, to my son, uh, who is still gaming, I try to understand what it means to communicate so much on your flat screen and on your computer. And one thing came very clear to me, it has to do with sensory deprivation. Online communication is only audio-visual. It is only looking and listening, that's all. So all the other senses are deprived, so they are not there anymore. And this is something I think very important. And when you uh, Google sensory deprivation, the first uh, thing you, uh, you get is this torture. Sensory deprivation is used for torture. Uh, it's a very important uh, 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 tool. And I think when our universities or companies are pushing us to go online and have those online meetings, work at home and communicate from home with your computer, in fact, it is stimulating a kind of collective self-torture. It is really reducing uh, our focus to only the audiovisual. So this leads also, in my opinion, to a kind of affective deprivation. You, you lose that was my main concern by having meetings, for example, uh, on online. You lose a kind of affection. You lose a kind of emotional connection you have when you have a physical contact with somebody. So smell is also important. Touch is important. Temperature is very important in the context to have a good com uh, uh, communication, but also to find empathy uh, in other people. It's really, a flat screen is knocking this down. It's literally making this flat in my eyes, this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of uh, emotions. So, and this leads to me, and now I come more and more to art and aesthetics, also to what I call an aesthetic deprivation. And I see aesthetics, I know it's a very old-fashioned uh, uh, term, but I see aesthetics as aesthesis, the literally, as Baumgarten once mentioned it, it's, it's, it's the combination uh, between uh, the senses, but also how senses, and all the senses, so not only looking and listening, all the senses, uh, relates to your emotional system and your effects. So I see aesthetics also something as something which is in between people, but also between people and nature. Aesthetics is in a way, is in a way, a way of standing in the world. It is, it is how we, it is, it is how we touch the world in which we are living. And that's why I think aesthetics is so important, and I think artists has a role there to fulfill. So we are discussing a lot about ecology and that maybe art uh, needs to be instrumentalized to solve ecological problems. I would say do it the other way around. I think make your autonomous art and think about what you are doing with aesthetics, and there is a solution to at, at least broaden up again our way of and our relationship with the world, which is, needs to be more than only audiovisual. So it is really learning to explore our senses again, which is for me a very important thing artists uh, can do. And in the book, I, I try to uh, uh, explain a little bit of how artists do this and how they did it in the past and how I think and, uh, to the future, uh, how they can deal with aesthetics. One is very uh, um, 
obvious. I think it's the classical thing or maybe the cliche idea we have of aesthetics is thinking beautiful. It's uh, making beautiful pictures like this of, of uh, doesn't, it looks better there than here. But anyway, here it looks blue. Uh, so this is blue marble uh, picture. Uh, was sent to the world in color for the first time in 1972 by uh, uh, NASA. And it's interesting what it did. Um, after 72, you see two things happening uh, in the world. You see enormous growing of um, ecological movements. So there's enormous uh, uh, increase of, of, of those movements. So people get aware because of this picture. So not because of science. Science, we know that the world was round and that the world was finite. But because when we saw this picture, we realized that someone, oh, this is only what we have. And maybe we are alone in the universe. So this was a very important influence. So this is what a picture can do. And this is what art also can do, is just by showing something beautiful, uh, realizing that it makes us consciously of, of something. So for me, it's, it's the first thing what aesthetics can do. It's representing the unrepresented, uh, what, what we didn't see yet trying to show uh, uh, to the people. But it's still, of course, this beautiful thinking is from a distant gaze. It's still looking what is central uh, in it. And it is like looking at the landscape. I, I make also the metaphor for in the book of the, uh, the landscape painter. It's literally looking from a distance to uh, the landscape. But what you can do with this is, and this is inspired by Jacques Rancière, uh, maybe a lot of you know him, uh, others. It's, it's literally a way to redistribute the senses. You can reorganize our sensitivity for things by showing other things in another way. Not anymore black and white, but blue marble in that sense. So this is the first thing, I think, which can work very, can work as a very um, convincing aesthetics to, uh, to intervene in ecological um, uh, matters. Just one anecdote, I live in Antwerp. We had a long uh, discussion in Antwerp, in the Antwerp city, about uh, the circular way around uh, the city of Antwerp. And there were activists who want to cover those circular way for ecological reasons. Uh, that was the, the reason. And they, of course, invited artists to show beautiful pictures of how it would look when the circular is covered with beautiful parks, green, etc. Nobody says when they cover the circular, of course, that there will be green on it. They can also build on it. But that's, that's again, what, what an artist can do. But it's also, as you discover probably, also can be very much related to propaganda. It is really showing another world, another possible world. So it can be used also in a positive and in a negative uh, sense. Going one step further, I think aesthetics can do also something else. And it, it, this is in a kind of aesthetics as aesthesis, as I mentioned already before. So literally feeling in two ways of the meaning of feeling. It's literally touching, but also uh, emotionally uh, feeling. And a lot of artists are busy uh, also with that. I think who went to Documenta 15 knows what I'm talking uh, about. So all the senses, it's trying to, uh, to relate all the senses to emotion. So it's not only more looking, landscape painting, but it is really diving into the landscape, going into the landscape, and I call it, maybe it's a stupid name, but I call it situational in situ art. It is really, literally going, uh, going at the spot, at a certain uh, uh, place, and getting in touch with the local concerns, the, with the local environment, to make your art. I have here an example, it's, it's uh, Costco, uh, it's a beehive, 
what he what uh, behave what he made, uh, but there's also uh, a space for meditation in it. Uh, it's for the bees also, and it's also a place for political discussion. So this is what the, on the on the spot on on a certain place where there need to be bees, more bees. Uh, so this is this is a typical example of another way of making art nowadays related to ecology. So going on the spot, uh, looking for the local rhythm of life, and it is a way to try to resonate uh, uh, with life and the environment. Uh, and this resonation is, is for me very important, come from Hartmut uh, Rosa, who talked about that, that we lost resonation with the world, especially because of digitalization, again. Uh, so again, going local is a very important, let's call it aesthetic strategy or something like that of artists, to uh, be aware of uh, and get also responsible uh, as Donna Haraway uh, calls it, for uh, your environment, the people, but also nature uh, around you. But this kind of aesthetic strategy, which we are more and more, I think, familiar uh, with, a lot of artists are busy with this, is only related to uh, what Bruno Latour would call Gaia, biosphere. So the biosphere is, as I understood it well, the maximum, the very maximum is, I think, uh, uh, something like 10 kilometers under the ground. And it is, uh, what is it, three kilometers, two, uh, two kilometers uh, above us. That's it. That's the biosphere. That's Gaia. And a lot of artists are busy with Gaia. Uh, uh, but it's, for me, one strategy. And I think there needs to be still another one uh, to, to discover and some artists are busy with this, and this is, is not related to Gaia, this is related to what is called Shton. It's the underworld. It's, what, it's the world of, of the dead. It is the world of fossils. Um, so I call it, I didn't find a better name for it, I call it dead aesthetics, uh, because it's really going not through the landscape, it is really going under the landscape and looking what is happening there. It is trying to find, and this came up in the book, especially uh, with working with people of the, uh, the global south, indigenous people also, it is related to our ancestors. It is trying to make a connection via aesthetics and via art to uh, the people but also the life in general, what was there before uh, us. And making this connection is a very important thing. And maybe it's, it's um, a challenge for, uh, maybe it's the biggest challenge we have for cultural mobility. When we think about cultural mobility, we think about traveling to other cultures uh, or traveling from one country to the other, but the I think the culture which is the most first removed from us, at least in the global north, is the culture under our feet. So it's very local, but it, we are really suppressing a culture of our ancestors and of the dead. We saw this literally uh, uh, during COVID-19. I think in the Netherlands, they still didn't have a collective uh, ritual to remember the death. We don't know anymore how we can deal with this ritual. So in that sense, it's also a very important uh, thing, I think. So it is really thinking about our sense of uh, vulnerability. That's really a tongue breaker for me, this word, of fragility, uh, and thinking about uh, our universal mortality and relate to it. For me, it's not spiritual, it can be, uh, uh, but it is a kind of art which at least is thinking is what is deep under our foot. And I, I, I took here a picture of uh, the artist, uh, it's a Belgian artist, Els Dietvorst. Again, this looks not so nice on the big screen, but anyway, it's called Coastal Shrine. It's in Ireland uh, built uh, during COVID. Uh, she, er, she goes to swim there every day in the sea and she started to put one white stone uh, uh, on this uh, rock uh, uh, just to say 
I'm still here, I'm still alive, because you, you, we were in those bubbles, you could not uh, have social interactions, etc. And in almost a month, all those white stones came up, and still after four years, it's still uh, building up with a lot of artists, uh, 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 this shrine. So this coastal shrine is a kind of sign of life, but also of that. Uh, people also put it literally stones there when by, uh, somebody uh, passed away because of COVID, etc. And it still is, is used, is used like that. So she literally also, she literally also works with mud uh, uh, and clay to make this kind of relationship with uh, our ancestors. And I think this is an other way to think about uh, ecological uh, principles. Anyway, this uh, brings me uh, to, again, the role of aesthetics in a fundamental way. I think we have to rediscover the, the power of aesthetics to build eco-political communities. And I've stolen this a little bit, in a way, from Giorgia Gambon, and some of you know him, the, 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 uh, the very strange Italian philosopher who uh, was fighting against the Italian government because, they, uh, uh, because of their measures during COVID. Uh, he said, no, 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 no digital courses. You no, need to go to the university uh, because lessons need to be uh, uh, physically. Uh, you need to be there. What was, of course, a huge discussion uh, is I'm very provocative uh, at this moment. But, but, but what he meant was literally, you need to be physically together with other people you don't know to have a democracy. Uh, you need to be related to other people physically to build up trust relationships, for example, in a society. So that's why we need this. And I translated, so he said, you need a sensory foundation for a political community. I think for an eco-political community, you need an aesthetic foundation. It's literally rediscovering all our senses and how this related to emo uh, our emotions to make a relationship with the world. And from that on, you can develop, I think, a very progressive eco-politics uh, um, in general. So this means also a democracy not only of uh, people, but also a democracy of things, of nature, which we involve. Okay, and I start. Uh, I end with uh, with this. What was also the recommendation? Let's say it uh, uh, in the book. It's it's really important. I think to rethink literally of how, as artists, we can reset our senses, and I mean also collective senses, of course. How we can redistribute them. It's very important, and we come tomorrow also in the workshop uh, on that, to slow down, to find other ways, I think, to, to make productions and get out of a kind of very strange accumulative production way, uh, which has also to do with aesthetics, uh, trying to embed again uh, with aesthetics. Dance away the crisis, sounds a little bit strange maybe, but dancing is literally getting with your feet on the ground. It's very important. It's a very beautiful interview uh, in the book uh, with a Brazilian dancer who, uh, who literally says, I feel when I dance the ancestors, ancestors in my body. Uh, and they are there and we have to rediscover them to solve ecological problems. Uh, it's, it's an amazing idea, I thought. And as you could imagine, the last one, feel again. Thank you. Hey, whoa, 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 there's a bit of a confusion here in the corner. I think this... Um, Applause proves that you're not a bad keynote speaker. <laughs> and we do not have a lot of time. Maybe we could have a little bit more light in the room. But if there are a few burning 
thoughts, provocations, questions in the audience, we would love to give that opportunity. If there's somebody that really feels you want to speak now, there is one over there. Can we have a mic? Yes, mic. Okay. Maybe introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Catherine. I'm the Artistic Director of Dirty Protest Theatre based in Wales. And I really enjoyed your presentation. I love the idea of returning to our senses and what makes us human and those very innate connections that we have, even just being in a room together like this. I'm interested in how your work, which in this presentation is so related about senses relates to people and communities that are um, disabled people or people who have sensory deprivation and that the context is that through the pandemic a lot of our work moved online like so many people and we found that overall our work especially with young people and mental health absolutely responded to what you're saying but a large proportion of people who said technology is fantastic Zoom is brilliant. I have never felt more connected to people than now were people who were deaf, deaf blind, blind, and young people with neurodiverse conditions um, and people with those experiences. So I'm just interested from your opinion, how do we um, involve people who may not on a surface seem to be connected to these things, whereas people with neurodiversity people from poor backgrounds, people who are deafblind, they said, this technology allows me for once to feel included in a way that previously I was not included in the room. Another one. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, uh, the, the technician said you don't have to give, uh, never give your uh, mic to somebody else. I did this, sorry, I did a mistake for that. But uh, to answer your question, of course, I'm not a technophobe. Okay? So it's, it's, uh, uh, we need to use all the techniques we can use uh, to make a better life. So it's not against technique. Uh, and when you can help people uh, to have maybe to explore in another way their senses, it's fantastic. Uh, we need to use it. So that's not, certainly not what I want to say. It's the other way around. I want to say is be aware <laughs> that that's what I want to say literally always to my son every day. Be aware what you are losing and also in a way even unconsciously forgetting in being sensitive in other ways. Uh, and that's, so this is the only thing, uh, uh, let's say the only message uh, I, want to, uh, I want to give. But of course we can use techniques to, uh, of technology uh, to, um, yeah, also to explore. I work with AI. Uh, I work with a lot of artists with AI, so for example. Uh, but need to be aware what you can do and what you not can do uh, and yeah how you replace it i just give one example to make it more uh, concrete we are now busy in uh, we made a re uh, horizon uh, proposal a research uh, with ukraine uh, to um, we know in ukraine at this moment 60 percent of the students don't go to school anymore so our question is how can you make a very good educational environment with ie but which is knowing that you lose a lot of senses. Uh, so this is this is a discussion I want to provoke also and try to uh, uh, to put in uh, in this kind of research. Sorry, it's a long answer, but I, uh, we have no. one hand way back up there. If you can pass the mic to the... Oh, you're coming down. Great. Fantastic. And then I'm afraid my team is telling me that we are going to have to round it up. 
Hello, thank you. For, whoa. Hi, my name is Stefan Prokhorov and thank you for your presentation. You speak a lot about senses, um, but I think it's very important to mention one that was not. This is the common sense. Uh, we had elections two days ago and uh, fascism is winning. So even though I enjoy feeling my ancestors in my feet, how do we translate all of this to people who actually are going to vote because what we're going to have in up to four years is you, in Europe is going to delete uh, all of the beautiful notions of this meeting. So how do we relate this to actually what is going to happen with our current democracy? Thank you. Thank you. I, I come from uh, two months of debating with politicians in Belgium. Uh, we had also yeah, the European elections, you know, but uh, we had also the federal uh, elections and uh, the elections of the regions. So it was very heavy and I, I, I discussed for the first time in my life with a lot of people of extreme right, uh, political parties who... Uh, um, yeah. Uh, if I had the answer, <laughs> I would definitely give. But I think one thing is important. Uh, and it was, I think, today in the Belgian newspaper, it's a political scientist who says that we need to stop moralizing the problem. We need to stop moralizing extreme rights. We need to act politically on them. That's the first thing. Second, it's very important to find, and this also has to do with census, to try to understand what they are meaning. It's very strange. It's finding empathy for the enemy. But it is. We need to. And when I talked with them, I completely understand. And I was also, I completely understand also what I understood that some things, and not all of them, of course, some are just stupid guys, but some are very intellectual uh, and very, uh, know very well what they are talking about. But I understood certainly about certain concerns people nowadays have about the future, about uh, uh, their children, uh, has to do with something I also feel, and that has to do with the loss of what I would call the commons, or the loss of community. And they have a totally other vision about how to solve this. I agree. Uh, they say, but we need to go back to community. Or community, white community, of course. Uh, uh, the national Flemish aliens, or something like that, uh, in Belgium. But it is the same feeling the left has I think, and it's the same response on decades of neoliberalization and individualization. And I think it's, it's another response, but it, has, it deals with the same problem. So there it starts. I think we start from the same fragility, uh, need, uh, and we have a totally different response. And I think there we can find solutions to start Talking again with them, that's also another thing. We need to start, if we didn't start yet, talking with them. It's very important, uh, as long as they allow us to talk with them, still. Thank you, Pascal. So, dear ITM members and all international guests, we are just about to go to a reception and say cheers, but before we leave the room, Vasco and I really want to thank the two teams that have made this meeting possible and whom you can direct your thoughts and questions to throughout the meeting. And I really think it's important for you to know their faces because these are brilliant people. And first up, I want to introduce you to Rosine and Toy, our brilliant production team members. Lotte and Giselle, our communication wizards.
Margarita, our head of membership. Emil, our new training and project coordinator. And last but not least, Abdallah, who takes care of the ITM wallet. In addition, we now have Ilana working back with us. She's somewhere in the audience. Many of you remember her when she was head of policy and research with ITM, and now she's working with us on freelance basis. Over to the top presentality. They are not everyone here. Sami? Uh, I don't see everyone here, but first I would like to thank and to point to our amazing uh, coordinator of the meeting, Martina. <laughs> the producer, Vesela. <laughs> Technical director, Ralica. Wallet, Maria, they're all working now. <laughs> it's been really a challenge to prepare uh, for nine months ITM while having three, four, sometimes five events per day. So without them, it wouldn't be possible. I cannot list all of them. We have 45 people. I'll do that at the end on the brunch and we'll get there together. But now it's time to go to... Reception. Before, before though, we have yeah. to say thank you to the IATM board oh, for the trust yes. that you have put in us. And thank you, IATM members, for your dedication to this network, for coming and enabling us to run an organization which, amongst other things, strives to provide you with and offer you Hopefully, strong, large, meaningful gatherings like IATM Sofia. And now, let's go for a drink. Yes, on the terrace.